Um, I want to talk about two um, ways that we can think about access, equity, and inclusion. One is UDL and the other is um, culturally sustaining practices. And I'm going to get to that one in a second. Um, and again, this may be a new term, universal design for learning to you, um, but it's actually not new in terms of what we've been talking about these past three days. So um, I think you'll be surprised to see, maybe not surprised to see that what you've been building already for your classes through this institute um, really can already help make it more accessible to students. So universal design for learning is a way of thinking about face-to-face -face and online classes and hybrid classes, really any kind of teaching we do that makes it more designed for a diversity of learners. Um, and one of the things I love about universal design for learning is that it reminds us that diversity is the rule, not an exception. That is, learners are diverse. Learners come from diverse backgrounds. They come from diverse um, experiences uh, with diverse needs. And, um, and that when we design for learning, we should be designing for diverse learners because that's the learners we have, rather than some imagined learner um, that we think we should have or, or that we've always kind of tailored our class to. Um, and so thinking about diverse learners as the, the reality, um, as the norm here, um, is a good way to get into universal design for learning. Um, and universal design really just talks about asking ourselves three questions. And there, there are, um, whole websites and, and um, conferences devoted to UDL, and I encourage you to get, get out there and learn some more. Um, but when I think about UDL, I really think about just three questions. Um, the first is the why question. Um, does your course motivate and encourage diverse learners? Can they answer that why question? And of course, we talked about that already, right? We talked about making sure that the purpose of your assignments is clear to students, um, that we, motivate students by giving clear criteria, right? Not just that C plus circled on the back page of my blue book, um, but really that we motivate and encourage diverse learners by making clear to them um, uh, the understanding of why this matters and how to be successful. The second question is a what question. Um, it's the materials question. Does your course present learning opportunities and materials in multiple ways? What are you providing? to your students. An example of this might be captioning uh, your videos. Um, and um, Deborah has included in her fantastic um, guide some information about captioning videos. Um, I will tell you the videos that we send out to you each day. We just upload those to YouTube and YouTube auto captions. It's not perfect, but it is other one, one other way to present that course material to students, especially if you're going to do um, pre-recorded videos that might help more kinds of learners engage with your course material. Um, and captioning videos um, doesn't just help uh, uh, learners with, uh, with hearing disabilities. It also can really help people who just need the video to slow down um, because you're introducing terms and ideas that are new to them and they want to be able to go back and hear you say things and watch you say things in different ways. It may help people who um, your say your video deals with sensitive topics and subjects that they don't feel comfortable listening to out loud in um, the midst of their, I don't know, family or in the tiny room that they have at home. Um, and it gives them a way to still participate in that video uh, without having to sort of out themselves about these sensitive topics. Um, and then the third one is the how. Um, how can students show that they are successful? Diverse learners show that they are successful. Do you offer many paths to the same learning goal? And of course we've, oops, We've already talked about this in terms of your assignments and giving students some choice. I loved listening to um, Anne uh, talk about her, her classes this fall and how students were given choices about the language that they're going to use um, and about the person that they want to work with. And, and I just thought that was so inspiring and a great example of giving students choice um, because the goal is the same. The learning goal is the same for all those students, but giving them freedom and choice within there allows them to play to their strengths. And so that becomes sort of the basics of universal design. Um, is there a motivation 
to do the work that you're asking your students to do? Is there a way to provide learning opportunities in multiple materials, multiple ways, um, such as captioned videos or videos sent out after the event, like we also did for this uh, institute? Uh, does your co course offer many paths to the same goal? How are they going to get there? Um, are you providing opportunities for student choice? Um, that, is that is universal design in a very basic nutshell, but I just wanted to show you that what we've been talking about already is going to provide better access to your students um, and, and that it's not about reinventing a million other things, um, but that the way that we've been thinking about it all along is about um, providing access to more learners. Access, equity, inclusion piece that I want to add is uh, something called culturally sustaining practice or culturally sustaining pedagogies. And this has become um, a, a way of thinking about our students, not from a deficit mindset, but from an asset mindset. That is that our students bring things to our courses and um, to their, their uh, fellow students that are valuable that shouldn't be um, like stamped out of them, but that should be embraced as a kind of knowledge and a valuable knowledge that comes from who they are, where they come from, who they were. Um, a, a professor named uh, Django Paris is kind of famous for having brought the language of culturally sustaining pedagogy uh, to higher education. And what I love about culturally sustaining pedagogy is it sees our students as co uh, creators of knowledge, uh, that we together make something more robust and interesting and valuable to everyone than if we say, I'm the only one with knowledge, what you know or thought you knew or the way you spoke prior to this or the way you wrote, that's not valuable anymore. Um, and, and sometimes we do that unintentionally, but we can build in moments and places um, that again, it doesn't take a huge revamp, but just small ways that we can add um, culturally sustaining practices to our teaching. So the three questions here are who, how, and what. And the first question is who is asking yourself and finding out who are your students? What have they experienced? What knowledge or skills or resiliency do they bring to your course? Um, and again, thinking in that skills-based, asset-based mindset um, that they're not you know, blank slates on which we write true knowledge, but that they bring knowledge, they bring resilience to the classroom. And so um, in this case, um, an early assignment, Deborah talked earlier, about you know sort of early interactions, formative um, interactions that you should have with your students to build community. Um, maybe you want to have them write a short discipline-related autobiography. So um, I was thinking about this in terms of, I'm sorry, Mary, but I had a terrible experience in chemistry one, and it's probably because I didn't have you as a professor. Um, but uh, I would write quite the discipline-related autobiography about my experience with chemistry one. And then of course, a professor in the future would know what kind of experiences I brought to, um, to that meeting. And you would know as the professor, okay, so our students already know these things. They already have these values or they have these maybe sometimes traumatic experiences. And so part of what we'll do here together is help them see and build confidence, which is exactly what Mary does in her classes. So I'm, I'm very jealous of her students uh, in that way. Um, so finding out who your students are, asking them to write a short discipline related autobiography. Uh, I taught a class for CGU last year on inclusive pedagogies and our first assignment was a your experience with education and our students bring so much because of their uh, experience with education. Not all of it is positive, but all of it shows their resilience and their desire to be successful. It shows a kind of knowledge base that I wouldn't have access to that now we can draw into our community conversations. So the first part of, of culturally sustaining practice is finding out who your students are, giving them a chance to, sh to share that with you. The second piece is um, not only taking that student's knowledge and values, whoops, um, and experiences, but putting them now um, into connection and conversation with the, the knowledge, experience, and values of others. Um, so for example, 
um, if you have a course where you have uh, a very famous study that your students read because it's you know, sort of a hallmark study for better or worse in the field and you want them to have that, that experience with, this is you know, how the, the field came to be. Um, can you now take what they have told you about who they are and what they know and what they know from their experiences in the past and put it in conversation with that piece? You might wanna ask questions in your discussion board like whose voice is missing uh, in this study? Whose knowledge is valued? And just giving them a chance to say, oh, right, wow, this study was done with only 40 uh, Ivy League white men. Um, that probably doesn't represent the folks in my community. Um, and so our experience of it might be different, right? Whose knowledge is valued? That is, what kinds of processes um, are seen as right and what kinds of processes for gathering information are seen as not right? Um, and, and what does that mean in terms of their own ex past experience? It's another way that you can sh show them that you're not trying to stamp out that knowledge, skill, resiliency that they've built, but that you do want to put it in conversation and use it then to critique, um, to change things, Oops, there we go, um, and to build, a, again, co-construct more robust knowledge. So then that third piece is, what can they create having asked those questions, having thought about their own experience, having put that in relationship to other um, sorts of experiences and knowledges? What can they create, critique, or improve that draws on those intersections? Um, could they build based on a previous study um, that only surveyed right, college age white male students? Um, could they build a more community aware survey that that brings their own knowledge and understanding of a community into conversation with that previous study? Could they write response op-eds? Could they write response letters um, to their, to their um, representative or, to, or um, response poems to a, a you know, famous poem in the field um, that sort of maybe doesn't, doesn't give a robust description of, of a lot of people's experience? Um, all of these ways, um, value who the students are. And again, these are just, any of these things that are listed here are things that we've already talked about um, in terms of, um, you know, not, uh, discussion boards or early class um, assignment, getting to know you assignments or short videos that they can create. Um, and any of those things can um, be added. Those are my puppies. They're excited about a cat, I think. Um, and uh, any of those things then can can draw your students in um, and give them uh, a sense that their knowledge, their perspective, their communities are valued and, and that we're not trying to, um, to ignore those, um, but to bring those in to make our, our, our knowledge more robust. So those are the two, um, universal design and culturally sustaining practices, both of which, again, I feel like, um, you know, it is not, necessary to redesign your whole class, but if you're still feeling a little overwhelmed, um, a couple things that I would recommend, and then I'm going to give you a chance to think about those things for maybe two minutes and, and write down some ideas. Um, universal design uh, advocates really talk about the plus one mindset. So um, is there one more place? So just not adding everything, but adding one more thing um, where you can offer students a choice perhaps in an assignment that you've already built and designed? Um, is there one more place where you can help bridge differences in access? Maybe use that survey that, that Deborah um, mentioned earlier today and, and, and invite your students to share with you what their access needs might be. Um, one more place that you can connect to their values or previous experiences. Um, and then um, maybe think about access as Synchronous, I, I love this. This is um, uh, Flower Darby and, and uh, Karen Costa's idea. Think about synchronous like sauce. Um, access for some students is limited and Zoom fatigue is real and the trauma our, experience, our students experienced and the trauma that we experienced um, over these past several months is real. Um, both the racialized trauma and the pandemic trauma and the rapid pivot trauma, all of it. Um, and so because of that, um, 
maybe stepping back from one place that you might have wanted a synchronous meeting, but that maybe would give your students a little more breathing room. Um, maybe that's one change that you can make to something you've already got stepped up. And then um, the, the third suggestion is um, find one more place to connect to your students' lives and values, to make a connection, personal connection, like in your grading, for example, like we talked about yesterday, can they see you as an authentic, connected person in this process? Um, can you connect your assignments better to your goals? Um, can you connect to um, their knowledge already?